Luke 24, 13 through 32, that records something that takes place on what has been referred to as the road to Emmaus. We'll begin reading together at verse 13. And I'll re read to verse um, 17, and we'll get into our study. Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned and that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. He said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? We'll stop there and we'll pick up, obviously, in a moment. But this is an event that we see that is taking place on uh, the same day as the resurrection. We see that there are two disciples. Uh, one of them is named in verse 18. His name is Clopas, and we're going to see... Uh, that he is named, but the other one is not. So there's just simply two disciples, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple. And they're on their way to a place that today is historically um, a mystery. People don't know where this particular city, the city of Emmaus is, outside of the reference here in Scripture and how it was stated in verse uh, 13 that this particular city is seven miles outside of the city of Jerusalem. And so what it is, is these people here are, on, are taking a walk. Now, it's obvious that they're outside of what we would call the apostolic group, uh, and, and what they're doing is they're returning more than likely home to the city of Emmaus. So as they're walking, they're also talking, and they're talking about the events that they just experienced. They're speaking about what they have seen recently there in the city of Jerusalem. They're speaking concerning the things like the crucifixion. They're speaking of the story of an empty tomb, of angels appearing to women as well as to others. And, and as they're speaking amongst themselves as they're, as they're talking, they're questioning as to why this all had to happen. They didn't have the information to help them understand what had taken place, and so they're conversing about this. It says in verse 14, they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And so as this is taking place, Jesus himself basically attaches himself to their to their walk, and, and, uh, and he's just walking alongside of them. It says in verse 16, their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And so, as you're looking at this, I want to give to you a little bit of a background, develop this for you, because sometimes when we think concerning the Easter Sunday event, how that the Lord Jesus was resurrected, we sometimes may think that Jesus was resurrected in and that he just went on to heaven on even the same day. Sometimes people think that, uh, but that's not what took place. When you read the rest of the gospel accounts and when you read the book of Acts, you see that there are some things that took place, other things that are recorded for us. In Acts, for example, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, when, when Luke was writing the book of Acts, this is how he began that book. He said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the Lord Jesus Christ is resurrected on Easter Sunday, but he didn't ascend into heaven for 40 days. And so there are various appearances that he makes during that time. And you see these appearances spoken of in Scripture. If you take notes, you might want to note this. We know that in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, that he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. We know also, according to Matthew chapter 28, uh, that he appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Luke 24, verse 34, points out that he appeared to the apostle Peter. In uh, Luke 24, as well as John chapter 20, he appeared to the 10 in the upper room. He appeared to the 11 a week later, according to Mark 16, verse 14. He appeared to seven of the apostles at the Sea of Galilee, as is recorded in John 21, 1 through 3. He appeared to the 11 on a mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. He appeared to 500 eyewitnesses, according to 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 15, verse 6. 
He appeared to James, more, more than likely the Lord's brother, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. And he was seen at his ascension on the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. So on a variety of occasions, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was seen in his resurrection form. And so what we have here is Jesus appearing to two disciples in order that they may be able to serve as witnesses of his resurrection. Now, it's important to note that it speaks of two disciples here because according to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, it takes two to be eyewitnesses. And so what they are is they are eyewitnesses of what is called a post-resurrection appearance. These are the men on the road to Emmaus. Now, they're conversing amongst themselves and they're reasoning and so Jesus draws near to them, and he goes with them. So as they're speaking, Jesus now joins their conversation, but they don't realize who it is that they're speaking to. Now, I want to show you something here, and all of this is kind of like a, an introduction. I want you to notice verse 16. Notice how it says, their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. They don't realize who it is. You see, when you read that, you need to remember that some people teach that Jesus assumed different physical appearances when he was resurrected. There are those who teach that Jesus actually was in different forms, that he actually had different bodies. They teach that Jesus was spiritually resurrected, but that he would assume a physical body at will. And so when you speak to them, they may say things like this. They'll say, well, how about the fact that when uh, Jesus was seen by Mary, that Mary uh, saw him as a gardener? And so they'll say that Jesus took upon himself the, uh, the appearance of a gardener. And uh, they'll say that, that he didn't look the same because Mary saw him and thought that he was a gardener because he looked like the gardener who had come into that particular area there where the tomb was. Um, they will actually point to this particular verse here, and they'll say there are two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus is walking alongside of them, and they don't recognize him, and they will say because Jesus had a different appearance. And as I've discovered in Scripture, and as I've discovered as a believer, the best thing to do is to answer uh, scriptural questions with Scripture. Did Jesus Christ look like a gardener? when he was there in that tomb area speaking to Mary. All you need to do is just take into consideration it was dawn. Mary was weeping, therefore her eyes were clouded with tears. Jesus is there in the darkness as she's speaking to him. But in, uh, in John chapter 20, verse 15, it says, Mary supposing that he was the gardener. And what that tells me is that she made a mistake. She made a misidentification. She supposed him to be the gardener. It doesn't say that Jesus looked like a gardener. He wasn't walking around with some shears or anything in his hand. He didn't look like a gardener in the classic sense of that. She supposed him to be the gardener because he was there early in the morning. Therefore, she thought that he was there to tend the gardener. She, garden. She made a mistake. Jesus was not in a different appearance whatsoever. Here in verse 16, it says their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. This tells us that, that the Lord Jesus Christ did not reveal himself to them at that moment. Their eyes were held back. The word restrained simply means that. It's held in check. But was Jesus Christ resurrected in the same body that he was crucified in? The answer is yes. How do we know that? Well, in John chapter 20, verses 27 through 29, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears and speaks to the 11 there in the upper room, the first time that he had spoken to them, uh, Thomas was not present. But the second time that he speaks to them in that room, Thomas is there. And Thomas had earlier said, unless I put my hand into the wounds that he's received in his crucifixion and all, I will not believe. Jesus now appears to him and says to him, Thomas, put your fingers in my wounds and, and you will believe. You will know who I am. And so Jesus is there still carrying the wounds of the body that was crucified and was placed into the grave. Jesus Christ was physically resurrected in the same body that he was put to death in. And so what Jesus is doing here is he is, he is restraining their eyes so that they don't recognize him. Well, why would Jesus restrain them from recognizing him? And the answer is a real simple one. The simple answer is we cannot see him unless he wills to disclose himself to us. That's how you get to see the Lord. That's how you have a relationship with him is, is, 
Jesus Christ wills to disclose himself to you. In Matthew, in chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. See, the way that I came to know Christ and the way that you came to know Christ isn't that you hunted him out, it's that he sought you out and he revealed himself, he disclosed himself to you. He does that through the word of God and he does that by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But he does reveal himself to you. This last week I had the opportunity of going to, um, to teach at a pastors and leaders conference in uh, Calvary Chapel of the South Bay. And while I was there, I was in the back of the, of the sanctuary talking to some of the guys in between um, teachings, and uh, a young man approaches me and as I was seated in the back, and he walks up to me, and he, and he says, Pastor David, can I, can I talk to you for a moment? And I said, sure, of course. And so I walked into the back of the sanctuary with him, and he says, you know, he says, my mom was listening to an interview that, that you gave on KKLA last week. He said, with Frank Pastore, how Frank was asking you to give your testimony. And I said, yeah, I was sharing my testimony. Uh, he goes, you know, as you were speaking, you mentioned an event in your life. You mentioned that you had a friend named Ray Cazada, and that Ray was across the street from your house. And what had happened is this, is that I have a friend named Ray Cazada, and he was at uh, a party uh, that was being held across the street from where I lived with my parents at that time. I was about 18 years old or so. And Ray had gone to this particular party. My mom had spoken to me, and my mom had said to me, David, please don't go to that party. I have a bad feeling about it. She knew that my friends were going to throw a party, and, and for once I obeyed my mom. I didn't go to the party. I went to some friend's house. And I got a phone call at my friend's house. My mom called and said, Ray got shot tonight. I had grown up with Ray. We had been friends since we were in kindergarten. I had grown up with him. He was one of my closest friends for many years. She said, David, Ray got shot tonight. And so the next day, some friends of mine and I went to the Studebaker Hospital there in the city of Norwalk. And he was in an ICU unit. And I remember... Um, climbing on each other's shoulders and standing on each other's shoulders to get up to look into the unit to see Ray because Ray was hooked up with all of these tubes and everything. And while Ray was there, and Ray, I believe, was 18 years old, 18 or 19 at the time, Ray died. What had happened is Ray had been having a running problem with a guy by the name of Pete Cook. And Ray and Pete just didn't like each other, and they fought more than once, and Pete had shown up at this party and once again, Ray and he were going to go at it, and they went into the backyard. And a man by the name of, a young boy by the name of Mike Torres, who was about 16 years old at the time, saw that this was taking place, and Mike ran home. It was only a couple of blocks away, got his gun, ran back to the party. Now, Ray was one of these guys who was a, a ground and pound kind of guy. He was a wrestler. And so what he did is he dove at Pete to take Pete down so that he could fight him on the ground. But when he dove to take him down, Mike leveled and fired and shot Ray in the head. When he shot Ray in the head, Ray collapsed to the ground. Pete, seeing what was taking place, turned around and started to run away. But Mike leveled on him and shot him too. So he shot two guys. Mike went to jail for that. And I was mentioning this. I was saying these were the things that were taking place in my life at that point that were making me wake up to the reality of the life I was living was going to end up in some pretty serious problems. And I just shared that. So this young guy walks up to me and he says, you were speaking about Ray Casada and Mike Torres. And I said, yeah, I was, Mike. He says, my mom was listening to your interview. And... Uh, and told me about it. She said, he said, um, my name is Mike Torres, and the guy you were talking about was my father. And so he said, my dad is doing time in Soledad right now. He said he was imprisoned after he got out. Mike spent some time in um, juvenile 
detention, got out and committed another crime, went back to prison, got married uh, in between apparently, and Mike Jr. was born. And he says, but I want you to know something. He said, my father committed his heart to Christ while in prison, and he's going to be getting out pretty soon. And I said, give him my email and have him write with me, write to me, I said, because we go way back. And I started talking to him about his, his uncle, whom he says, you know my uncle? I said, I went to kindergarten with your uncle. Yeah, I know your uncle. And we started talking. And as we were talking about that, Mike Jr. saved, his mom saved, Mike Torres, who shot my friend Ray, got saved. It's the Holy Spirit who does those kind of works. It's God who can reach into somebody's life and transform. Can you imagine what I felt like all these years? It's been 40 years. It's been 40 years since Ray got shot and killed. I still remember him, still mention him because of what had happened. And, and, and in between, in those 40 years, God opened the eyes of Mike Torres, who shot a friend of ours. He, Mike and I were friends, and a friend of ours, Ray, shot him to death, and yet he got saved. God does that. God has a way of reaching into people's lives. God has a way of opening people's eyes up. And it requires the Holy Spirit to do that. It doesn't happen on your own. It doesn't happen because you're seeking out God and trying to find God. God is not far away. You're the one who's lost. God has to seek you out, and that's what took place. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus restrained them from recognizing him because unless he reveals himself to you, you cannot see him. That's the whole point. He restrained their eyes. They could not recognize him. They didn't know who it was that they were speaking to. And, and later you're going to see how he does reveal himself so that they do know who he is. But that's how it works in the things of the Spirit. And so that's what's taking place here. Now, as Jesus joins them in verse 17, he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? And the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests... And our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they, when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And so as the Lord speaks to them and says, what is it that you were speaking about? What kind of, what is this conversation uh, that you've been having with one another as you walk and are sad? So the Lord Jesus Christ begins to break into their conversation and speaks to them. As he's walking along with them and they're in this personal conversation, at the pro proper moment he interrupts them with a question. Now, in a way, it might seem a bit personal as they're having a private conversation, and yet he does. He breaks into their conversation to ask this question. You know, he's the one who can answer their questions, so they should be asking him. He's the one who can answer the questions, so we ought to take our questions to him. I think sometimes people take their spiritual questions to the wrong people. As a matter of fact, I know that they do. You have a spiritual question, and rather than asking somebody who has a relationship with the Lord, you may make a, a mistake in asking someone who doesn't know the Lord. You have a spiritual question, and you go to somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God, asking him to give you some insight into the ways of God. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, the Scripture says. There's a wisdom involved in asking your questions, asking questions to the person who has the ability to answer those questions. In this particular case here, they have someone right in front of them that they should be asking, Jesus himself, who can answer their question. You see, if you have questions, if you have questions about God, why bother going to those who also have questions? I got an email recently from somebody, and this is what he said. He said, I attend a Calvary chapel. I find that I often have theological type questions but have no one to really discuss them with in a logical manner or that the questions I ask no one seems to have answers for. And so I responded and wrote back and, and what I said to him is this, I said, well, if you're going to church, the best thing you can do is go to your pastor or, or go to one of the church leaders who are there 
because that's what they're to do. They're there to be ones who can instruct you. They're there to give you the answers to your questions. You see, that's what pastors and that's what ministers are intended by God to do. When Jesus was speaking to one of his apostles, the apostle Peter, it's found in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. Jesus, as he's speaking to Peter, simply said to him, feed my sheep. And when he was speaking to him, he was saying, you have a spiritual responsibility to give spiritual food to those who follow me. That was the responsibility of the apostle Peter. In the book of Acts, when, when Paul was uh, speaking to some elders from the, the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he said to them in verse 20, I have kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He said in Acts 20 verse 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And then later in verses 31 and 32, he says, Watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. If you have questions, you need to take the questions to the word of God because God supplies the answer through his word. Also, God has placed people in the body of Christ who are teachers of the word who can communicate to you the things of the Lord from the word of God. And so when you have a question, take it to the person who can answer it. Take it to the Word of God. Take it to God and say, Lord, I need some insight into this. And as you hunt through the Word of God trying to find that answer, perhaps you won't find it. You can come to me if you want to. You can speak to one of the guys in, in our fellowship who, who are on staff and, and ask them. And we will do everything we can to get that answer to you. And that's what we ought to be doing. And in this particular case, what you have is you have them with a question, but they're speaking to the one who can answer it. And so as he is asking them the question there, why are you so sad? Why are you walking in so sad? Verse 18, well, the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? So what they do is they see him as a visitor to Jerusalem who somehow has missed what had happened. Now, that's not a polite response, by the way. They're sad and, and they're not happy that, that he interrupted them as they were talking. But as, as they speak to him, Jesus goes on in verse 19, and he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. And so they begin to fill him in on what has taken place. They outline what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. They begin to share with him these things. They speak of him in verse 19 as Jesus of Nazareth. And notice with me that they say, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. Now, when they say that he was a prophet, uh, there are those who would say that they were reducing Jesus from Messiah to simply one who speaks for God. But we need to remember that in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, Moses was speaking to the children of Israel. And he said, as God was speaking to them through him, uh, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. And so the Messiah is likened unto a prophet like Moses. And during the time of Christ, when they were speaking of the prophet, they would be speaking of the Messiah. That's what you see in Acts chapter 3, verses 20 through 25. They, they identify Jesus as being the prophet that Moses had written about. And so what they do now is they begin to outline what had happened to Jesus Christ. Their response is one of disappointment. They were hoping that it was Jesus who would deliver them. They regarded him as their redeemer, the one who was to redeem them in terms of purchasing their salvation at great cost. And what they're doing at this time is they're concerned that Jesus is still dead and, and uh, they had known that he had been in the tomb, and that's what they're speaking about. They say that in verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today's the third day since these things happened. We're greatly disappointed. We thought that Jesus Christ, the one who could walk on water, the one who could raise the dead, the one who spoke words that nobody ever heard, the one who performed miracles that no one had ever seen, 
We thought that this man was the prophet. We thought that this man was Messiah. We thought that this man was the Redeemer. This is the one who was going to save us. We believed that with all of our heart. But three days ago, as he was put to death, our hopes were crushed. And we at that time lost all certainty as to who he is and who we thought he was. But they go on in verse 22, yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went into the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So they're saying some have gone to the tomb, but they didn't see Jesus. There's no visible proof that this thing has happened. So there's a war going on within them right now, an internal war, a, a war between disappointment and hope. They can't believe that this actually happened. They really want proof. They want to know for sure. They said, but they went to the tomb. There's nobody there. We have no certainty that this has taken place. And that's why we are astonished because they have said things that, that is just beyond us, our, our ability to believe. On one occasion, Jesus had a friend by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus that Lazarus, a dear friend of Jesus, had died. He was actually sick unto death. And the Lord Jesus Christ tarried where he was for a while and ultimately made his way to where Lazarus lived, to Bethany. And when he arrived, Lazarus had already been dead and was in the tomb and had been buried for four days. And as Jesus was speaking to both Martha and Mary, Jesus had made a statement to them that I think that we need to remember. Jesus in John chapter 11, verse 40 said, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? If you would believe, you would see. We have a tendency of saying, seeing is believing. Jesus said, if you believe, you will see. If you have faith and hold fast, you're going to see God move in a marvelous way. These men are saying the tomb is empty, but we haven't seen a body. And because we haven't seen the body, we're having a difficult time believing that Jesus indeed is alive. And so as they're saying that to him, verse 25, then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, wouldn't that be an incredible Bible study? Wouldn't that be good if we had that on CD or DVD? Man, incredible Bible study, wouldn't it be? Because Jesus began to speak from Moses, from the prophets, and all the scriptures. Moses represents the law, the writings. The prophets obviously speak concerning the things that the prophets have stated concerning Messiah, but he also tied in the scriptures that expounded on the fact that God would send a Messiah. From Genesis in chapter 3, verse 15, which is the first promise that God gives in Scripture concerning one who is going to, to be the Savior. From Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God's first promise of Messiah, to Psalm 49, verse 15, where, where God says, where, where the psalm says, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. He gives to them a Bible study, and he points out to them from place to place how the Scripture speaks concerning Messiah, what Messiah is going to do, how Messiah is going to be treated, what's going to happen when he's treated in a certain way, and he gives them a Bible study that is so thorough, is so incredible, so deep and detailed. And so I say, wouldn't that be great to have that Bible study? And the answer is you already have it. You have it in the Bible. You have it from Genesis to Revelation. You have that Bible study. All you need to do is get to know the Word of God. All you need to do is spend time in God's Word because all Jesus did is he quoted from the Scriptures the things that pertain to him. Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 specific prophecies in his ministry. 
Jesus Christ was born in a certain place and died in a certain way. He was resurrected in a certain day. It's all there in Scripture. And all you need to do is realize that the Bible is unique of all books on the face of the earth because it contains prophecy that has been fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. We have that. You don't have that in any of the so-called religious books on the face of the earth. You don't have that in the Quran. You don't have that in the Bhagavad Gita. You don't have that in any of, in any of the other so-called holy books. You don't have prophecy because the devil cannot prophesy. But what you have in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament is prophecy. You have the Word of God that declares to you things that God is going to do prior to him doing those things. You have something called prophecy, pre-written history. And all Jesus had to do is point back to Genesis and all the way to the Psalms and various places in the prophets, and he can say, this is what it said concerning Messiah. This is what it says concerning Messiah. This is what it says concerning Messiah. And it's all pointing towards me. And as they're walking with one another there, and Jesus is opening up the Word of God to them, these disciples' hearts are beginning to be just flooded with the things of the Lord, and it's absolutely blowing their mind. It says in verse 20, 28, then they drew near to the village where they were going. He indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the Scriptures to us? Did we not have a case of holy heartburn? God moved in a powerful way. And he opens up the Word of God. And he speaks to them, and as they're listening, they're saying to him, they're saying within themselves, this is an amazing thing. Now I can see what you're talking about. But as he gets to the end of the journey there, and he begins to move on, and he's about to walk away, they invite him to remain. You see, for him to remain with them required an invitation. If they had no interest, he would have moved on down the road. The same is true for us, guys. For us to have a relationship with God requires an invitation. It's been said that God is a gentleman. He doesn't bull his way into your, into your life. He doesn't do that. He is a gentleman. He, he awaits you, your invitation. I want to have a relationship with you. I have a hunger for you. I want to know you. He awaits that. Even after you get saved, there are times that you have to have that mentality of, I want more from you. I want to know you better, Lord. It's kind of like what Jeremiah 15, verse 16 says. Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I have a hunger for you and a desire for you. I have a thirst for you. I have this longing to know you. And, and I want to spend time in your word. And I want to spend time hearing from you. And I want to have a relationship with you. And it's the thing that motivates my entire life. It's not a part-time thing with me. It's a full-time thing. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you in the ways that you have. I want to understand you. I want to be somebody who's not only able to speak about the things that you've done, but I want to have a relationship with you that, that I'm able to explain why you do the things that you do. I want to have a relationship with you so that I can say that I just don't know things about you. I want to be able to say that I know you personally, that I have a depth and an understanding of you that is so real and so deep and so powerful and so passionate that, that I, I can speak with, with authority that I I know you, not about you, but that I know you. Like that old story of that actor and, and that old man who were invited to, to recite their favorite psalm before a group of people, and the actor comes up and recites Psalm 23, and as an actor, he's capable of of, of just, just doing it well. I mean, he's, he's been trained how to speak in in public, he's been trained how to pause and how to emphasize certain words, and, and he gives that, gives that psalm. And then the older man is invited to, to say the same song. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as he begins to recite Psalm 23, and he said, this is my favorite psalm, like this man here. Someone in the audience was heard to say, the actor knows the psalm. But that old man knows the shepherd. And that's what the Lord wants to do in us. He wants us to not only know, but to have a hunger 
a preeminent hunger, a passionate hunger, a great desire. You know, when people um, get married today, most of them want to get married in a church for some reason, even if they don't go to church. Most of them want to go to uh, get married in a church at least. So they'll go and they'll rent the church and they'll have their marriage there in the church. But that's the last time they enter into a church. When we do weddings here, we encourage people to not only occasionally go to church, but be involved in the church, to serve in the church, to grow with their fellowship. Because if you serve the Lord together and if you as a husband and wife read the word of God together, the chances of you making it are much higher. Did you know there's this, this is an old statistic, you know, it's, it's a few years old now, but it's an amazing statistic. Do you know that married couples who read the Bible together daily, their divorce rate is one in every 1,050 marriages. One in every 1,050 marriages. It's the reading of God's Word together on a daily basis, that habit of pursuing God together that keeps them together, that keeps them together. My kids are, one's married, but three of them are of marriage age, and, and I speak to them sometimes as their dad. And I tell them, listen, if you want to make it, if you want to make it as a married couple, you better serve the Lord together. You better learn to pray together. You better learn to read the Word of God together. Because if you don't do it, every force in this culture and this society works against you surviving. Every force works against you surviving. You know, and I tell them, you know, I come from a generation where, where people my age were, were raised by people who stayed together. My mom and my dad were married over 50 years before my dad went home to be with the Lord. Marie's mom and dad were married over 50 years before her dad passed on. We came from a stable society. I know that in hard times, you don't just pack up and give up. I know that you work it through, you hold fast, because it's not easy. You know, it's like Pastor Chuck, who's been married six, um, what has he been married? Not 60, he's been married over 50 some years, and he was given, he was asked a question, how, how, uh, how did you survive so many years? And Pastor Chuck said, well, the first 40 years were hard. <laughs> well, you know, it's just this matter of holding fast. You hold fast to your relationship. You hold fast to the Lord. You hold fast to those things that matter. And, and you work those things through. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it. You need the power of God. You need the Word of God. And you need to have a hunger for the things of God. You need to have a passion within you, a passion to know God and to know His Word as an individual and, yes, as a couple for those who are married. And those who are dating, that ought to be something that's part of your dating ritual. There ought to be a, a, an open love for Jesus Christ that you have one with another. Because these people, when they were listening to Jesus speak, they said, our hearts burned within us as He was speaking. There was something within us that caught fire. There was some kind of recognition. This is the voice of the Lord speaking to us and encouraging us and awakening us. And so what happens, and we'll close with this, is they drew near to that village. He indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening. The day is far spent. He went in to stay with them, came to pass as he sat at the table with them. He took bread, blessed it, and broke it. Their eyes, and gave it to them, their eyes were opened, they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And so basically what happens here is that just a little while earlier, as we read, their eyes were restrained so they did not know him, but now they see. 
The veil is lifted from their eyes. They recognize him instantly, and then he vanishes. As he had left the sealed tomb, so now he leaves that home. But as he vanishes from their sight, their hearts begin to burn within them. And that's when they say to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us. As the psalmist said, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. There's this desire for us that, Lord, that the Lord would not only just reveal himself, but that we might have a walking relationship with him. Because in reality, what you have here on the road to Emmaus is you have a walk in the word. Because the Lord Jesus Christ in that walk revealed himself through the scriptures. And as we walk with the Lord, even so, he reveals himself to us through his word. And that's what we need from the Lord is a walk in his word.